What a wonderful meeting we've had so far. I give honor to Brother Adams, Sister Adams, this congregation, all of the, the sponsors of this meeting, and all of the, the leadership that is present here. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 10. Praise God. Give honor to Bishop Wilson, Sister Wilson, and all of their investment and everything they've done for the kingdom of God. And... Um, Looking forward to what God's going to do in the, the remainder of the services here. Praise God. First Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 10. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come thither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is he. I want to tell this group today, this is what I feel compelled to tell you in the Holy Ghost, that God wants this generation to know that the one who is keeping the sheep is the one who is going to get anointed. The one who's watching the flock is the one who God is going to put his hand upon. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. For just a few moments, I want to camp out on this thought, the ministry of keeping your father's sheep. You can be seated. Many scholars believe that David was somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 years old when he was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king over Israel. I mean, he was a kid, and I know our tar target audience here today is probably between the ages of 15 and 25. But what do you do after you have this kind of coronation ceremony? What do you... What do you do after that? We have parties and we have celebrations for everything now. It's, it's, so we, have the, we, have the, we have the wedding. We have the pre-wedding party. Uh, we have, uh, we have the, 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 the baby dedication. We have, the, we have the, the gender reveal party. We have a party for everything now. But what do you do after the coronation ceremony when the anointing oil flows down the head? And, and, and everybody's standing around and they're looking at, at this young man and their mouths are agape as the anointing oil of God dripped down his hair and into that ruddy face. What do you do after the anointing oil begins to flow? And, um, but, but this young man, he, 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 leaves this, he leaves this moment and he goes back to the sheepfold and he goes out to keep his father's sheep and I'm not sure exactly how long it was but in the process of a few maybe a few months just a short time he would be summoned again by his father Jesse and he would run to the house eager with anticipation to uh, to begin to, uh, to to figure out what his dad was doing with him and what he was summoning him for and and he, he abandons the sheepfold again for a moment to go on an errand for his father. And in the process of time, we realize that Israel is at war with the, the Philistines. And, and Saul is the general. And David's brothers are out front. And they are preparing to wage war against one of the most formidable enemies of the day. And Jesse calls for David. And David is, in the story, he is the forgotten one. He is the overlooked one. Time and time again, if you read the story of David, you realize that he's constantly being overlooked. And he's this sheep herder. And, and now maybe he's, maybe he's 15 and a half or 16, and his dad's calling for him once again. And he's doing a job, but it's a, it's a, it's a seemingly menial job. It, it doesn't seem to be very important. And, and he's keeping his father's sheep. And he is, I think, probably eager and idealistic and and he's the least likely if you were to look across even his brethren he was the least likely to be considered a man of war he was he was the least likely to be considered a king or head and shoulders over all of Israel you know the story he doesn't know any better he comes running into the camp 
of the Israelites and he slams on the brakes and he hears for the first time the roar of Goliath as he, as he challenges the nation of Israel and challenges the king of Israel and challenges the people of God. It is his king and his nation and his God, but he hears the challenge. And, and you could imagine, how many of you are 15 in the house, 16, 17, any, any youth in the house? You slam on the brakes. You, you come into the camp, and there are men of war all around, and, and he's listening to this challenge. He's listening to this, this boastful adversary of the people of God, and, and, and he begins immediately to challenge the premise. You know, you walk into a conversation. If you're going to be a theologian for five minutes, you got to learn to reject a premise because sometimes somebody will suck you into a conversation. And, and if, you don't, if you're not careful, you'll get three or four steps into it and realize that you should have rejected the premise from the very beginning. Here is a young man who walks into a situation where he doesn't seem to have any experience. And, and, and he looks around and he sees the, the king is there and the men of war are there and, and the, the adversary serial uh, camp is is camped out against the people of God and and he but he rejects the premise of the adversary and he begins to question every premise that has been established by the enemy it, it this the premise of the enemy of the enemy has already been embraced by the nation it's already the the group uh, psychosis has already settled on the Israelite camp because it's already settled on her king but a 15 or 16 year old boy walks in and he shrugs off the group psychosis and he says no I don't agree with the premise. I don't agree with what the enemy is saying. I, I refuse to. Now what does it take for a young man to get to the place? What, what happened in the sheepfold that would motivate him to walk into a place where he is the youngest and where he is the least experienced to stand up defiantly and look at the group and say no I I'm telling you if you're going to be a leader in your community in your family in your local church you've got to have a secret place somewhere where you get a vision that's so big that you can walk into a community that has generational dysfunction and stronghold and say nah I reject the premise I don't believe it has to be this way and I don't believe it has to stay this way I'm telling you God's looking for a generation today that he can pour anointing on that says, ah, baby, I reject the premise. It's not going to continue to be this way. There's something in him. There's something on him that looks around him and says, no, I haven't been here long enough to hear the sound of Goliath's voice reverberate over and over and over again. I'm telling you, sometimes you just gotta stop and say, no, I heard it one time and one time is enough. And so he rejects the premise of the adversary. There's something in him. There is a moxie in this kid. There is swagger that isn't the product of sitting in a Bible college classroom. There's something in him that it's not the product of sitting there listening to lectures all day and feeling entitled because he has a certain last name there's something on his life that comes into the situation and doesn't stop long. I've heard these men talk about putting your, your foot on the gas and pushing it all the way down you've got to live your life in a way to where you don't allow the enemy to say it more than once but you say no nah, if there's going to be a conflict let it start with me let it begin with me if there's gonna be greatness let it happen in my life let it happen in my church let it happen in oh, I'm telling you I don't care how old you are God can form something I've got 30 minutes I've got to move on He's an enigma. He's a par I know this is a teaching session, but I just I'm I'm doing what I feel in the Holy Ghost today. He's an enigma. He is a paradox. He is a walking conundrum. 
and his brothers hear him loud and clear. There's always going to be a dissenting voice of the adversary that hears your challenge. That the adversary rejects it and his brothers reject it. And Saul is having to realign his perspective to this young man who walks into the situation and says, no, it doesn't have to stop here. It doesn't have to be this way. They, they question his motive. There will always be people questioning your motives, but you can't get caught up in what people think because there's too much at stake. There's too much possibility, and there's too much potential. You can't get distracted by what your brothers are saying, and you can't get distracted by what the enemy is saying. And, and so they begin to question him, and they say, oh, by the way, we know you've got a haughty heart, and we know that you, you're, you're, you're puffed up with pride because when you challenge conventional wisdom, it comes across as arrogance but when the anointing is on you something comes on you that says no I'm not going to leave this situation the way that I found it and by the way they ask the question who did you leave those sheep with they despise the sheepfold they despise the sheep and they despise the fact that it was it was a it wasn't a noble job to do and who did you leave your sheep with but nobody knew better than David the state of those few sheep it wasn't a question his brothers should have been asking because I guarantee you David left the sheep in good hands the only person in David's life who was taking David seriously at this point was David himself his brothers weren't taking him serious his king wasn't taking him serious but David had something down on the inside of him that said I don't care who else is taking this place in my life seriously I'm taking it seriously nobody else was singing his praises but David had some moxie on the inside that said I'm serious about this seemingly insignificant place But you can bet your bottom dollar there was somebody looking down from heaven who was David's advocate, who was taking David seriously, a God who sees in secret but rewards openly. During this season of his life, David's brothers were out on the battlefield. They were on public display. They were engaged in public ministry. And David was in the wilderness by himself. He was inextricably linked together with this herd of simple animals. While his brothers were highly visible, they were standing and marching in front of Israel. David was not. He was inconspicuous and he was hidden. And he was was doing something important but nobody else knew that it was important. David was the forgotten one. He was was in a place where he was having loyalty and faithfulness forged in his spirit by the wind and the rain and the brightness of the moonlit sky and the simple needs of the sheep. Everything that David would need to have greatness in the kingdom of God was being born in him by the things that he was enduring. There was something being welded in him by the elements, by the heat and the cold and the constant demands of his life of solitude. Nothing will test your motives, young minister, like sacrificing for something or someone like simple sheep that are practically helpless to do anything against predators to stop the onslaught of an invasive force who respond to your voice like children who are sensitive but defenseless and needy. It does something to you when you marry yourself to the sheepfold. I don't mean the marrying together where you sit back and count the days and weeks and months until you get a promotion. As a matter of fact, the promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It is not horizontal and linear, but promotion comes from God. David was not looking for promotion. David had welded himself to this sheepfold. David had married himself to these sheep, and he did not allow anybody else to demean his responsibility. He learned to soothe their fears in every storm because he was there at every season of their life. As he played the harp, 
As he looked up at the heavens, he connected his God and his calling to these simple sheep. And as they were afraid and as they were distracted, he constantly rallied them back toward a single course and a single destination. And while he did so, he learned to praise his God. He learned to magnify his God. And so doing like the prophet Moses before him, he fell in love with these simple creatures. He was faithful in his father's house while he was keeping his father's sheep. He made sacrifices in private. He laid everything on the line and nobody even knew. He was winning private battles against his ego and his pride and his flesh. He didn't even know it because he was married to something greater than himself. And nobody was there to clap and shout and celebrate his victories. But something on the inside of David, some intrinsic motivation was being born that said, I don't need a crowd to be faithful. I don't need adulation and public uh, celebration to continue to be faithful to the calling that God has placed on my life. In exchange for public recognition, he felt the glory of God wash over him time and time again because glory will only visit you first in a place where you aren't getting the glory. Because no flesh is going to glory in God's presence. So if you're going to radiate the glory, the place that you're going to encounter the glory first is going to be in a place where you don't demand the glory. If you want the glory, you're going to give up his presence. But when the time came for him to stand in a public place, he wouldn't be preaching somebody else's sermons. Because... He had never won victories for himself. And I, 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 I shrink back, I recoil at the conversations I hear about young preachers preaching somebody else's sermons. If you can't preach a sermon, if you can't get a sermon in a prayer room, then you don't need to be a preacher. I don't care where you're getting the sermon. You need to make a commitment today. I'm not preaching anybody else's stuff. Because a sermon represents a private victory. A sermon represents a place of dedication and devotion to something greater than yourself. Ego will say, I want to preach somebody else's sermon because it preaches good. That sermon might be good for the congregation, but it's not good for you. The thing that is good for you is to get in a private place and find a relationship with God and get under the spout where the glory falls down and receive an impartation from God. And when you get that, you deserve to be behind a pulpit. And in the meantime, time go home and teach a bible study until you have a private victory when he stands in a public place for the first time the only story he has to tell is his story he tells Saul I was keeping my father's sheep I was bound together by a calling and a destiny uh, with God and with these sheep. And when I was doing that, in the process of being a husband or a father or a pastor or a leader, you are going to marry yourself to people. You, it's till death do you part. And in the process of walking through seasons of life with people, you will have opportunities to pray prayers when your faith is challenged. You're going to have opportunities opportunities to pray for sick babies when you don't have the money to pay the medical bill it's going to be in moments like that when everything's on the line and you're facing your greatest fears that your God is going to show up the God who is a God for every season the God who is with you in sickness and in 
that's where you get your sermon you can say yeah I was in a crucible I was in a difficult place and I cried unto God and he heard my cry and he picked me up I was in a deep place I was in a bad place but God helped me God saved me God delivered me and all I gotta tell you today is God is faithful that's not somebody else's message. That's a message born in the sheepfold. What time is it? How much time do I have left? Because we're not going to finish. Eight minutes. That's ridiculous. What are you supposed to do in 30 minutes? They won't give me an hour back at home. They want like 45 or 50 minutes. I got to finish the next week. How do you finish this? We're talking about Wilson University. We're talking about doing something great for God. We're talking about being, this is our developmental chart. This is what Brother Wilson would call form on form. Now we are, these charts represent what you'd get on a Sunday morning in a theology class at New Life. So we're going to give you a peek into a theology class. Brother Sutton's been teaching theology classes for 20 years. Now, this chart is something that we developed from a synthesis of ideas and concepts. And I'm just going to give you the gist of it because we could teach out of any of these for weeks, but... The highest level of actualization is spiritual replication. Transfer of spirit. The most important ministry you're ever going to engage in is the ministry that's closest to home. Let me tell you why. Because immediately, those who are theologically savvy would argue and say, no, Jesus couldn't do many mighty miracles because of their unbelief. And a prophet is not without honor saving his own country. But the, the opening blind eyes and raising the dead and all that wasn't the, wasn't the power of Jesus' ministry. No, that's, the Bible says an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. That's, that's a distraction. Don't get distracted by all that. The most powerful thing that Jesus did is transferred his spirit into people following. And what happens, and this is a, this is a, you want to know about a pandemic? This is a pandemic. People are in a, they, they are enamored with the sensational. The most important ministry you're going to do is you're going to get full of the Spirit and you're going to transfer the Spirit to somebody following you. Well, the question is, because, you know, you want a sound bite. You want just a little outline. You want to take it home and say, okay, we can do A, B, C and get it done. But the reality of it is, is that in order to transfer your Spirit into somebody following you, you have to be with them at every season. And there's this idea that if I get a travel trailer and I go out and evangelize and I preach a handful of sermons and I get pretty good at it and I can get people excited and pray some people through to the Holy Ghost, that that is an effective ministry. If my schedule's full, that's an effective ministry. No, that is not an effective ministry. That is one component of ministry. That's the beginning. That's, but the first fruits of a dynamic ministry are you are converted by your message. You are the product of your ministry. You're in, this is the deal. People say, well, what, what about Jonah? He had to go to Nineveh. He had to preach. Jonah's ministry was incomplete because everybody else got impacted by what he preached, but Jonah. Everybody got Everybody got filled up. The king, the people, everybody repented in sackcloth and ashes. And Jonah was unconverted. He was on the outside of the city, bitter, angry at God. He was not converted. That will connect you to this other chart that is a synthesis of a lot of things that we've put together, connected with all kinds of books. There are books out there. Read them all, but that's not all the books. There are a lot of other books. If you're not reading 
my goodness in heaven. When the Spirit comes and it anoints a life, the kingdom of God, the Bible says the kingdom doesn't come with natural observation. It's not low here or low there. The kingdom is within you. When the kingdom comes, it comes in you and it radiates out of you. That's why you can't be like the five foolish virgins that were out of oil. you got to be full of the Spirit. When the Spirit radiates out of you, the first person that it impacts is you. You are the product of your relationship with God. That's why you... You are your first convert. That's why, what Paul was trying to get us to understand. When he said, you know what would be a travesty? What would be a travesty is that after I got good at preaching and was able to preach to everybody else, I myself became a castaway. The first person you got to convert if you're going to be effective in ministry is self. And after you become converted, you have a chance of helping your wife. And you have a chance of helping your family. And you have a chance of impacting everybody on your job. And... And then, now when I put church here, this church, the whole city, the kingdom, the word, everything, the, John 1 and 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The whole kingdom of God is on the inside of you. How much time do I have left? Is it two minutes? Am I looking at that correctly, Brother Golden? I don't want to take any of your time. But the entirety of the kingdom came, comes down on the inside and it radiates out into every other area of life. And so public ministry is way out on the concentric circles. That's why Paul gives instruction about how you're supposed to be if you're going to be a bishop. Husband of one wife. He's saying, don't even talk to me about ministry until you have things straight at home. Because how are you going to stand up and tell people about how their marriage needs to be if your marriage is on the rocks? We don't need to talk about preaching. We need you to go home and start a prayer meeting with your wife and kids until you get the Holy Ghost and it... We don't need to talk about preaching yet. Why does it take somebody, some people till they're in their 40s to get ready to have public ministry? If it take, listen, if it takes you till you're in your 40s to start your ministry, then go ahead and wait until you get your life together. Go ahead and teach Bible studies and win souls and get your, get your finance. If you're not paying your taxes, we don't need to talk about you preaching. Whenever you're ready, just come take it. We don't even need to talk about preaching until you get this stuff squared away. Because you can't get people, you can't give them what you don't have. And so this entire idea about Wilson University and everything we're talking about. Now, I'm going to give a caveat here, Brother Wilson, and I really... I honor you in everything you're doing, and I want to be clear in how I say this. But my bishop, Barry Sutton, did not get what he put into us from Wilson University. He got it from, he called Brother Wilson almost 30 years ago, and Brother Wilson came to Birmingham, and they walked around a park for eight hours, I think, or six hours, and he just peppered him with questions. He said, Brother Wilson, what do I need to do? How do we have revival? And Brother Wilson gave him a list of things he needed to do. Books to read, things to implement, and he started implementing those things at New Life. As a matter of fact, when I went to Wilson University, Brother, Ho Brother May, what's my nickname? Dr. Collins. He says this everywhere that we go, and I tell him, I'm not a doctor. I haven't even finished my master's degree yet. He said, no, it's, uh, he, he, he thinks I'm a doctor. Well, I got him duped. I, need, I can get him to talk to my wife. Maybe everybody can get on the same page. I'm Dr. Collins. <clears throat> but this is why. Because when I enrolled in the degree program at Wilson University, I had already read all of the books. So I got in the classes 
And I'm having the conversations. Oh, like, yo, ultimate leadership, the Wilsonian vinculum. Yeah, I've, I've set through, I sat through two years every Sunday morning of reading ultimate leadership with my bishop and a class full of young leaders. And I, we, we read it together and we memorized the concepts. And then I took that book and for 15 years, 15 years, I worked with young people. And guess what I taught them? I taught them ultimate leadership. We taught the vinculum. We have business owners in our church that use the Wilsonian vinculum for their business structure. They're not preachers. But Brother Sutton developed every leader in our church as though, or every individual in our church as though they were a leader. So when I went to Wilson University, I was exposed to the ideas from a classroom setting after my bishop had taught them to us over a 20-year period of time. So to the group, I came across as being some really intelligent person. But let me tell you something. I don't know where you come from today, but I was born in a home with a dad who was raised Roman Catholic. My mom, before they got in the church, my mom was pregnant at 15 years old. And my dad dropped out of school. That was, listen, you can't, you can't choose your daddy. You don't get to pick. Well, I wouldn't have been raised. Well, guess what? That's the, that's, that's the lot. I was raised in a home where at a certain point, my dad looked at me, my brother and me, and he said, it's time to drop out of school. And I said, uh-uh. My brother did. He dropped out. Because it was just a family pattern, right? And I said, no. Because I can't marry that sweet woman back there and sit at the table with her daddy and not have a college degree. And so we fought about it. My dad's a good man. He's a Bible study teacher. He's in the church, but it was the house of the familiar. I was raised in a home where not only was education not celebrated, but because of our familial framing, it was denigrated. But I, I was born in the home I was born in. I couldn't pick my dad. I couldn't pick my culture. But because of my dad, God gave him a dream and he brought him to Birmingham. And because of that dream, I was introduced to Barry Sutton. And because Barry Sutton believed in young people and believed in the entire congregation and took something that this man taught him and he took it seriously. Sober. Man, he held that up for me to reach up and grab. And man, you want to talk about hopping up on your back foot trying to touch something you could barely touch? I was raised in a home where education was just, go get a trade. But let me tell you what that did for me. Let me tell you what that did for me. I lived under the stigma of filling my entire childhood like I wasn't enough. And I wasn't smart enough in school. I was convinced I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. But I had a pastor who had a, a flock of sheep. And he invited me into his theology class. And we had some knockdown drag out fights. I was insecure. I was afraid. I didn't feel like I stacked up. But he would, he would hand out books. He expected me to read them. And not everybody in the class read the books. But I had something burning on the inside of me. And it said, well, maybe you're not enough. And maybe you're not smart enough. And maybe nobody believes in you. Maybe nobody knows who you are. But maybe you could just read the book. Maybe you could just take it as seriously as he took it. So I started reading the books. And I didn't know everybody else wasn't reading the books, Bishop. I just kept reading the books. And as I'd read them, he'd drop them down. And I'd pick them up. And I'd read them. And then I, 
I went in that little classroom. I, I heard you talk about what you did when you went to SAC. You're talking about a laboratory and how you just went in and started mixing chemicals. But I, I had that little youth class because in a, in a handful of years in my early 20s, Bishop Sutton thought enough of me to give me the youth class. And I, I had these kids were nobody. I mean, they didn't have a pedigree. They didn't have a last name in Pentecost. They were just kids that, that, that he handed to me. And he said, hey, how about this little flock of sheep? And so I took the book, and I was like, man, there's some stuff in there. I didn't even understand most of it. I just started teaching it. And something started happening in, in that class. This stuff works. It works. It works for them. And it works for, it works for me. I'm over time by seven minutes and 45 seconds. I owe you lunch. I'll buy it. Here's my closing. The key is you have to take it serious. There's a story in Sun Tzu's The Art of War. We talked about the Wu and the Chu, ancient Eastern cultures. And in the process of time, these two people were going to come together and fight. And I think it was the Chu outnumbered the Wu three to one. There was no chance they were going to win the fight. So the emperor, he's reaching out to everybody in his kingdom. What do we do? They're coming. We got to fight. And Sun Tzu comes and he says, I can, I can help you. There are some strategies that if you'll implement these strategies, you can win the war and you can preserve your entire civilization. And the emperor said, okay, how do I know that your strategies are going to work? He said, I'll tell you what to do. He said, if you'll give me your palace women, your concubines, your ladies hanging out around the, around the palace. They lived in opulence. They live in plenty. He said, if you'll give me these women for a period of time, I will train them, and I will make a demonstration of them fighting, and I will show you the strategies of war. Now, the art of war is still taught all over the place in military, in, at, at, in all kinds of places. The army still teaches out of, out of the book. So he takes the palace women and he trains them for a period of time and he brings them together. And he calls them forward and he says, okay, here's the instrument of war. You've been trained. Take what you have and fight. And as they stood in that environment, the opulence, the plenty, the beauty, because there's something about living in those conditions that you can't even conceive of everything being at stake. They started laughing and giggling. They couldn't take it seriously. They had all of the instruments of war. They had everything that they needed to win the battle. But they giggled and they laughed because they could not even conceive of a world where everything was on the line. And finally, Sun Tzu had enough and he pulled out his sword and he walked over to the two women and he cut their heads off. Blood dripping off the end of the sword. Everyone in the palace mouths agape, shock. And then he looked at the next two women in line and he said, now, come forward, fight. He was given the freedom to train the soldiers. The battle was fought and it was won and the empire was saved. This is where we are, 2021. Whether you realize it or not, everything is on the line. The glory, the wonder, 
the majesty, the power. It belongs to us. I came here today. I didn't send an outline. I just had a burden. But I came here today to tell you, everything's at stake. Everything's on the line. There's never been more opportunity. There has never been more at stake. It's up to you. Don't despise it. Don't despise your day. And do not make excuses. Because everybody's got an excuse. Let's stand. Lift your hands to heaven. Let's talk to God. Just for a moment, go ahead and press your way into prayer. In the name of Jesus. Praise God.